Welcome to Sahara TV's Country Focus segment. I'm Karen Atia. Ethiopia has been in international headlines recently, but not necessarily in a positive light. In the past few weeks, the Ethiopian government has sparked international outcry over its crackdowns on media and freedom of expression. Ethiopia has consistently ranked very low on international indexes for freedom of expression. Ethiopia has the second highest number of journalists in jail in Africa and the largest number of journalists in exile. Several weeks ago, prominent journalist Eskinder Nega was sentenced to 18 years in jail, being accused of fomenting terrorism. This week, reports surfaced that longtime ruler Melez Zenawi is critically ill in the hospital. What would an Ethiopia without Zenawi look like, and how would that change dynamics in the Horn of Africa? Here to talk to me today is Mohamed Ademo, Ethiopian journalist and blogger. He's been quite vocal about the situation in Ethiopia, and we are grateful to have him on the show. He can be found on Twitter as at Opride. Thank you for joining us on Sahara TV, Mohammed. Thank you for having me. Okay, so as far as, again, the situation um, for journalists in Ethiopia is consistently ranked as one of the worst places to be a reporter in the world today. Can you sort of, again, describe the situation that journalists face and what is it like to try to report in Ethiopia? It is very difficult. You're looking at Africa's largest, most, Africa's most populous nation that has no press freedom or no press, free press to speak of. And uh, uh, it is in that situation people are trying to write about the things that are going on in the country. When they do that, they get arrested and also get charged with high treason, uh, high charges of uh, treason and terrorism and other things for attempting to, to overthrow the government. So it is a very difficult and challenging environment to be a journalist. And as you have clearly mentioned, it has the highest number of journalists in jail and al also in exile. And, and they're also charging not journalists in Ethiopia with this terrorism charge, but those who live in, in the West and write critically about the government. So. Has it always been this bad? Um, you see, prior to the 2005 election, uh, things the the fledgling press press was press was gaining some momentum. They were getting more critical, and there was a window of opportunity to actually, for the first time, have sort of a free press in Ethiopia. But when the ruling party, uh, the EPRDF, lost election uh, that year they understood that the role of media was important in changing or in, in informing the public opin opinion against the government, and that's why they lost. So that's when they, when they arrested the opposition leaders and all the journalists, in, including Iskinder Naga, mm -hmm. who spent 17 months in jail with his wife, who was also a journalist and gave birth in prison at that point. Uh, so that's in 2005, for 17 months, they arrested them. So things got off to a wrong start after that election because the government felt that they're not controlling the message and they are giving too much leeway in to, to, the, to the media so that they can turn people against them. And so in order to to contain that, arresting few journalists was not enough because there were those who were outside mm -hmm. who continued to write about, about these things. So what they did was they came up with a law where they can give it a judicious semblance of sort and say, look, this is our constitution and we're trying to protect the country from terrorism and we're trying to maintain peace and stability, which is what most people in the West donors like. Mm -hmm. So. Definitely. It got, it got complicated after that. So then with these terrible crackdowns on freedom of expression and communication, I mean, how does, you know, an average Ethiopian get any sort of news or any sort of information about what's going on in Ethiopia and the outside world? Um, well, it, it, is, it is very, it is difficult to say because, you know, there is no preference in the country. So, uh, interestingly, though, uh, Y yesterday, there was uh, the, the Justice Ministry uh, issued a, a, an order banning one of the last standing uh, paper in the country called FITI, which ironically also means justice. The paper was, is called Justice. And they issued, uh, you know, banning it is publication. And today, they followed that order up with another uh, saying that 
you can't even distribute the ones that you already published. So now we're looking at a situation where the government media, which has no shred of independence, mm -hmm. is the only alternative to the, gov the government propaganda. So there is no room there. So uh, how do people get news? Look, my website in, in many other diaspora-based opposition and also independent websites are blocked in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in even, even if the websites were open, only less than 1% of Ethiopian people have access to the internet. And you know, people don't have uh, the luxury of you know, accessing the web from phones the way we mm -hmm. do now. It's changing now, but it's still uh, far, far behind. So people used to turn to the, the free press, the independent press in the country. That's not there now. So it seems like there is no information. But luckily, though, the, the voice of America uh, America, VOA, VOA mm -hmm. broadcasts in three Ethiopian languages, the Oromo language, Amharic in Tigrinya, uh, and also Deutsche Welle in Germany, uh, also broadcasts in Amharic. So at this point, so like the only two but then again, you know, uh, how many people listen to those, yeah. we still don't know. Uh, now those aren't subject to any sort of censorship either, I mean, even if they're coming from foreign, foreign press services. The VOA has been in, in a lot of uh, uh, altercation with the government where the, the government following the, leading up to the 2010 election, mm -hmm. uh, they jammed the VOA. So uh, the, the, the State Department and the VOA said, you know, we're concerned and all this and it is not uh, right to jam our broadcast and we are independent. And the government said VOA is uh, creating, you know, havoc in the country and you are, in, you know, uh, inflaming things th that are not there. So what happened was, you know, a delegation from the Board of Governors in, in Washington, D.C. went to Ethiopia. They had a conversation and, and they, they allowed the VOA broadcast to go through. But VOA has been uh, thinking about uh, how to get around that. Uh, they've, uh, they've been broadcasting on the local uh, television station called Arabsat. Okay. Uh, and also uh, other mediums like uh, making it accessible on the phone right. and, and with low band with, uh, but they, they also have their own challenges. You know, the reporters for the, for the Deutsche Ville always get harassed sure. and, and, and they for many years refused to uh, uh, allow reporters to report freely or g granting them access to mm -hmm. uh, officials and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as, you know, the situation, the atmosphere, of the restriction of, of journalists, it's not just jailing and it's not just uh, shutting down houses, but it's also jamming frequencies, it's also controlling the mobile phone. As I understand, Ethiopia only has one telecom provider and it's through the government, correct? So I, I wanted to switch a little bit, um, a little bit to yourself because here we are in New York, you're, we're in diaspora, you're also blogging and um, uh, writing about situation in Ethiopia. Um, did you ever report in Ethiopia or you reported mostly from, from the states? I sort of picked up journalism as, uh, as opposition to government. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I was a student activist back home. Mm -hmm. uh, and after I came to this country, we tried to you know, raise awareness about these issues that doesn't get traction in the international media. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we reach out, we send media advisory, we hold human rights rallies, mm -hmm. and, and nobody really come and reports uh, this event. So I, that's sort of how I got into journalism. Uh, so I've, I've not formally, I was a reporter when I was in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, uh, you know, there are, there are a number of Ethiopian journalists, you know, there are a lot of them are here, about 200 some journalists who are oh, wow. exiled. Is there like sort of a, a community of, of exiled journalists? Is there is there any sort of coordination between you guys? I mean, what, what, is, what is the role that you guys play as far as trying to influence um, dialogue back home in Ethiopia? You see, it's, it's, very, it's very hard to, to say because oh. everything that I write, the people of Ethiopia don't get to see it because it is blocked. Okay. So, so is everyone else, uh, the rest of the journalists. So there is not one organization where you know we can we come together and work, but people are doing their level best. You know, obviously it is very hard to get information from Ethiopia. Phones are, uh, you know, they're listening to phones, and you call someone, you can get someone in, in trouble. 
it's not as easy as going and meeting someone at a cafe and, mm -hmm. and interviewing people. So it's, it's hard. But, you know, there, there are people who are, uh, who are doing some, some great work, but it's not, I can't say how much it is influencing the public opinion back home. But what, um, what I understand our role to be is there are these fleeting news uh, from international outlets, mm -hmm. and we, we add context to that in, in, in sort of uh, build on those and add perspective to those uh, news and information that come out of it. And it helps uh, the diaspora, which is very vocally opposed to the government, sort of uh, it gives them um, information to to campaign on or, you know, to use it for the advocacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, others who we hope would listen and see these things because Ethiopia, again, really relies on foreign aid. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. and We'll come back to that, that point as well. Um, so you mentioned earlier uh, journalist uh, Eskinder Nega, who was sentenced to 18 years in prison for, um, well, he was sentenced under the anti-terror law and accused of potentially starting a revolution against the government. And there was a huge international outcry, a lot of uh, campaigns to try to get him freed from jail. Can you uh, kind of enlighten us a little bit more? Why was the government so afraid of him? What was it that, um, that he wrote or that he was doing that you know, made uh, the government charge him with terrorism? Yeah, uh, when they arrested Iskander in 2005, uh, they thought that was going to, one, uh, scare him from continuing to write. Mm -hmm. Two, run away f like the rest of us did. To leave the country. To leave the country. So a lot of these threats, they are hoping that journalists will just leave the country and then they can go ahead and block. Right. So, I mean, I I it's easy for them. It's less headache if Iskander is out of the country. So that did not work. Iskander st stood his ground and he continued to write. And in, in he wrote, he wrote interestingly though, the last column that he wrote was about the anti-terrorism law in, in basically calling for press freedom in Ethiopia and also looking at, you know, last year was such an eventful year where, you know, the Arab Spring mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of things were happening and Iskander was trying to analyze those regional uh, uh, events, you know, what was going on in Nigeria, in, 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 um, in Egypt, Libya, and other places, and in hoping that, you know, is, is it, is asking those questions, is it possible that the Arab Spring, you know, would take a detour and come right. to Ethiopia? And, mm -hmm. and essentially, that was uh, seen as a threat, and uh, he's not leaving the country, he's not shutting up, what do you do? You put him back in the jail. So, that's sort of what they did. And, I mean, I, I've heard of countless efforts to try to free him, especially from the international community. I mean, is there any sort of recourse for him what, now that he's been sentenced? Sort of what are the next steps for him? Are there attempts to try to appeal? I mean, is there even any way to appeal the decision? <laughs> It's, it's a kangaroo court, right? I mean, th this is not a justice system. Right. It's not functioning. It's not independent. So you can appeal all you want, and you know what the answer is. But, uh, you know, there are, there, are, there are a number of people who hope on this idea that uh, Malas' regime will write, you know, a pardon letter as they did in the past, saying that, you know, we we indeed committed an act of terrorism, and we will stop writing these things in and let us out. In, in it's possible that the government can use Eskinder, and especially because there is such a wide international outcry, uh, use that as an opportunity to uh, strike to get some score. You know, to to score some points with the with their donors. Uh, they might pardon them or a few of them down the road. But at this point, there is no, I mean, I, I, I'm not very helpful. I mean, the, the, the State Department, you know, issued uh, one of those State recycled memos, memos saying that we are, we are concerned. And mm -hmm. Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, uh, who is on Senate Judiciary Committee, have issued about two press releases, uh, you know, to his credit, very, mm -hmm. uh, very critical uh, uh, releases at that. But those are just words. Sure. I mean, it doesn't do anything mm -hmm. in, unless, unless uh, the West uses it as leverage mm -hmm. to say, you know, do something here and at least f free the, the journalists, open up the media environment. Mm -hmm. But then again, the other argument is even if the West was willing to 
walk the talk, which they never do, right. even if they did. Uh, Malas knows full well that the West needs him more than he needs them because the Horn of Africa is going through interesting things. Look at what's going on in Ethiopia. For the first time in the history of that nation, the Ethiopian Muslims are rising up in millions mm -hmm. demanding religious freedom. And look, you know, Somalia has always been used as a scare tactic uh, for by the, the Ethiopian government to say that if we don't keep an eye on these guys, you know, the Al Qaeda is coming there. You know, there is there are established links of Al Qaeda and Al Shabaab, the Somali militant group. For all these reasons, Ethiopia. I mean, the U.S. has already set up a drone attack. Uh, point where they launch these things f in Ethiopia itself. In Ethiopia sits a very interesting, in a very important yeah. strategic point. So for, for all that, even if they say, no, you need to stop cracking down on, on dissent, <coughs> Malas knows that China is there to help. And he will say, if you want to go that way, I don't need your help, and sure. he can turn to China. So it's going to be an interesting... Uh, interesting experience as far as... Right. Uh, as, far as following what the West is saying um, and uh, to see how Ethiopia reacts. Now lastly, to sort of wrap up, since we only have a few minutes, um, you mentioned Prime Minister Miles Zanawi and uh, this week um, there have been reports circulating that he is critically ill in a Brussels hospital and so now people are reflecting on what would a post-Zanawi Ethiopia or Horn of Africa look like. Now obviously the government is coming back with their rhetoric saying that he's on sick leave and he's just exhausted from his many, many years of service and will be back in the office very shortly. But um, I wanted you to just comment briefly on um, sort of, you know, if Mela Zanawi at the very least is not able to return to his office, say in a few months, or at the very worst happens to pass away, what would a post Zanawi Ethiopia look like in the immediate uh, in the immediate future? Um, I don't see any change. I mean, no if change. you if you follow the the press conference yesterday and also what some of the senior leaders in the ruling party are saying. Uh, the next prime minister, for all we know, is going to be from the same party. This is, you know, we the the, the spin is that if Mullahs cannot continue doing his job, the parliament will elect a new prime minister. So it's still the same party. I mean, it, in, all the, the in, same in the parliament is made up of all but one person is an opposition. So the rest is one party. Mm -hmm. So uh, we already know one vote cannot make all the difference to elect a prime minister who is not outside of that party and right. it is only one person that is that can be elected and it is not possible so if the ruling party continues i don't really see any change for that matter i mean it's just recycling the tactics that they've been using for many years but you know some say that malas uh, was actually you know an intellectual uh, and sort of like an informed leader in his considerate in some 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 are thinking there is a power struggle within the party and that mm -hmm. might actually turn uglier sure. uh, because in fighting for the power they might mm -hmm. uh, crack down mostly on the Muslim protesters that I mentioned mm -hmm. and also uh, in dissent, on dissent. Okay, great. Well, well, we'll stand to see what happens. I mean, in the immediate future with Zanawi's health and, and for um, especially following the uh, plight of the journalists in, in Ethiopia. Now, is there uh, a website or um, a place where people can find you and follow your readings? to learn more about uh, about what's going on in Ethiopia. Yes, uh, they can follow me on allpride.com or, or follow me on Twitter at allpride. I'm also on Facebook. Uh, if you could just Google my name, Mohammed Ademo, it should be one of the first uh, links that come up. So there are a number of ways to connect. And uh, I hope you guys continue to watch the developments. And it looks like uh, these are interesting times for Ethiopia and very extraordinary in a lot of ways because uh, things can really uh, take the wrong turn. Yeah. Great. So. Well, thank you again so much, Mohammed, for joining us today. It was great talking with you. Um, so stay tuned for more from Sahara TV. I'm Karen Atiyah.